So good afternoon. My name is Trevor Brown. I'm the Dean of the John Glenn College of Public Affairs. And to the faculty, staff, students, university leadership, distinguished guests, I want to welcome you to the installation of the Neil Armstrong Chair in Aerospace Policy here at Ohio State University and the College of Engineering and the John Glenn College of Public Affairs. What, what a tremendous, tremendous day. Who, who would have thought that the day after celebrating the largest graduating class in the history of the university, and for those of you who, who don't have that fixed in your brain or weren't there to experience it, that's over 11,000 undergraduate and graduate students yesterday, one of whom is from your community. Uh, an honorary doctorate was given to NASA Administrator, or former NASA Administrator, Administrator Charlie Bolden, who some of you got to see last night, but it was a tremendous honor and a privilege for the university to bestow that award to him. But who would have thought that the very next day after such a tremendous event, the university could bring together all of you, such an extraordinary group of space pioneers, to reflect on the past and dream and plan for the future. It's a testament to the vision, the drive, and the collaborative spirit of this great institution and its leadership. Just over, just about five years ago, we had the great pleasure to host the 50th anniversary of Friendship 7, John Glenn's orbit around the Earth. And at that ceremony, the university received two very generous gifts, both of them connected to Neil Armstrong. The first was a gift from Mr. Armstrong to Senator Glenn. It's a piece of the moon that rests on the ground floor of Page Hall. It's a small rock, it's not big. I, I always envisioned that a moon rock would be something massive. It's, it's no bigger than a quarter. Um, and along with the joystick from Friendship 7, which is on the top floor of Page Hall right across the way here, it's the item that people most like to take pictures of or selfies of, uh, the moon rock. And when Neil Armstrong gave it to the senator, Senator Glenn immediately said thank you, as one would expect when handed something extraterrestrial. Uh, and then looked at it for a while and said, Neil, this sure looks like a piece of your driveway. <laughs> we, we've not been able to determine the authenticity of the rock, but uh, whether Neil Armstrong walked on it for three hours on the moon or every morning on his way to get the newspaper, uh, we are very, very grateful for that, that gift. The second was a generous financial gift from Huntington Bank, which is the basis for this chair in Neil Armstrong's name. Last night, we had a wonderful reception and event at the Huntington Bank to celebrate their gift. And this is truly transformational philanthropy. Huntington's gift provides us the resources to do something we could not have done before. We could not have brought John Horak and his wonderful family to Columbus and Ohio State without this gift and this endowed chair. And having the endowed chair with John sitting in it will allow us to make tremendous contributions to aerospace policy research, teaching, and application. Now, many thank yous have been said in the last 24 hours, but I was raised that you can never say thank you enough when a gift is meaningful. So I also want to thank the Armstrong family for bestowing the name of Neil Armstrong on this endowed chair. Listening to Administrator Griffin this morning and then Professor Hansen and lunch reflect on the temperament and character of Neil Armstrong um, affirmed for me and I'm sure for all of you what an honor it is to have his name on an endowed chair committed to the pursuit of scholarship in aerospace policy. What struck me most was the combination of achievement and character. I teach management and leadership courses, and one of the great debates that students like to have is whether someone achieves greatness by virtue of what they've done, their accomplishments, what they've achieved, or who they are, how they engage in the world and the values that they carry with them. Now, the answer I'm, I'm sure all of you know is that it's both. But this vexes young people of this generation, and some of whom are sadly cynical before their time. Having the name Neil Armstrong and the history and the passion and the spirit that comes with it connected to this chair, one that I know John will use to connect with students in the College of Engineering, the Glenn College, and students across the university, 
it gives me confidence that he will be able to use that to inspire and convince the next generation of space scientists, engineers, explorers, policymakers, that you can do great things and still be humble and modest and grateful to be a participant in a successful endeavor. Finally, I want to thank the academic leadership and the Board of Trustees of the University for creating the discovery themes. This endowed chair is also a discovery theme hire. It brings together two units from across campus to make the whole greater than the sum of the independent parts. I was saying to someone just last night how, how blessed I feel in the Glenn College for having even a minority share of John's appointment, as I know we're getting more out of him than the formal percentage of time that I'm actually compensating for. Then I realized that Dave Williams in engineering is getting more than his contribution to John's salary as well because John is the proverbial 110 percenter. This partnership and John serving as the inaugural chair is delivering far more than all the independent contributions that came to put it together. So now I'd like to invite my friend and colleague, the esteemed dean of the College of Engineering, David Williams, to the podium. Thank you, Trevor. Uh, it's time to talk about John, actually. We've done enough thank yous and everything else. So uh, it's actually been quite a, a long journey to uh, uh, the point where we are now, separated only by a provost, which is a, a good separation. Uh, John and I first met almost a decade ago uh, down in uh, Huntsville, Alabama. And uh, those of you who've been around today know that the thread of Huntsville uh, runs through this whole meeting. Uh, I was then the newly installed president of the University of Alabama in Huntsville, and Margie, my wife, uh, was invited to take part in a program called Leadership Huntsville, which she did. Uh, she was actually filling in for me because I decide, decided I was too busy to do that, but uh, it was just as well she did. Uh, a few days into that program, she came back and she said, uh, I've, I've just met uh, 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 a really smart guy, and I think you should meet him. And uh, so, yeah, sure, uh, but she was right, and of course it was John. And uh, uh, we met uh, at a place that had 345 different beers on tap, uh, which uh, uh, we had frequented uh, many times since. Um, but John at the time uh, was the Director of Science and Mission Systems at, uh, at NASA Marshall. Uh, a little while later, it became clear to me that I needed a Vice President for Research. Uh, and we were running a search for that position, and Paul Chow, my good friend, who was leading the search, uh, was asking me for ideas. And I said, you should go and speak to this guy I've just met, uh, John Horak. Uh, and so Paul uh, uh, went to, to consult John and said to him, uh, what would you do to transform research at UA Huntsville? And John gave him a very long and considered list. And Paul thanked him for his application. And uh, a few weeks later, John was the VP for research at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. And in less than three years at that university, he took our research expenditures from just over 60 million to just over 90 million. Uh, and it went on to be over 100 million. And in doing so, he transformed that university into the smallest, but still one of the only 75 public research universities in the nation to be in the Carnegie Tier 1 research universities, an extraordinary transformation led by John. John is a rainmaker for creative faculty, and he is a magnet uh, to sharp undergraduates, uh, just as he's doing already here uh, with Liz Newton, uh, moving many of our students uh, into the international sphere to present their work. He did the same in Huntsville, taking students around the world, uh, showing them what they can do if they just get organized. John, as you will learn soon, has a way with words. Uh, and on more than one occasion, I asked John to help me find the right words. Uh, at UA Huntsville, we had one of the more difficult uh, challenges that any university can make dealing with the aftermath of a shooting on the campus. And in those dark hours, it was John who found the right words. And he helped bring that fractured community back together. So in fact, nothing gives me greater pleasure than to once again have John on my team as a leader in the College of Engineering. I should note on a much lighter note uh, that we are both uh, squires of the Jack Daniels Distillery. <laughs> and uh, every now and again, he is known as Gentleman John. Uh, 
and we are aficionados of uh, fine distilleries on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, not to excess, of course. Uh, so John was a leader in Huntsville, the rocket city, where, as they say, it is rocket science. And already he's shown himself to be a leader in Columbus, the Department of Transportation's newly designated smart city. So let's get on with this installation. Celebrate John's transitions from the rocket city to the smart city, from Alabama to Ohio, from physicist to aerospace engineer and public affairs professor. And for that installation, we need the university leadership. So I'm pleased to introduce our provost and executive vice president, Bruce McFerrin. And I should note that Bruce was brought to the Ohio State University through the skills of that same search consultant, Paul Cho, who introduced John to the University of Alabama in Huntsville and tricked him into that particular position. So Bruce, please come to the podium. This is the chair document. I hold in my hand the document. Well, thank you, uh, Dean Williams and Dean Brown. It's an honor to accept the Neil A. Ar Armstrong Chair in Aerospace Policy on behalf of The Ohio State University. Uh, as you mentioned, Trevor, The Ohio State is grateful for the philanthropic investment from Huntington Bank that helped to make this possible and the outpouring of support from a variety of generous donors who contributed in recognition of the anniversary of John Glenn's Friendship 7 flight when he became the first American to, to orbit the Earth. Certainly fitting that this chair is a tribute to this legendary first and named in honor of Neil Armstrong and his historic first step on the moon. As our honoree today has said in the past, space exploration is indispensable to our lives. It's necessarily an interdisciplinary pursuit as well, requiring interconnections between the policy and technical communi communities. That's why this tie between these two colleges, the John Glenn College of Public Affairs and the College of Engineering is key. All endowed chair positions are meaningful for universities, but for Ohio State, the Armstrong chair has a special significance creates a compelling link between aerospace policy and aerospace engineering, the kind of interconnection that rarely receives this kind of combined focus. Our culminating celebration uh, now brings a, to close a day spent contemplating the global benefits of space exploration, spotlighting just how pressing this topic remains for all of us. Ohio State's the perfect place to convene this kind of conversation because the strength of our public policy and aerospace spheres, in addition to the broad cross-disciplinary reach of our discovery themes, as Trevor mentioned, uh, really creates a very unique culture. And now we have the Armstrong Chair to seal the deal. You may have noted in your program that others honored by endowed chairs have been inspired to look up in their own way. Uh, here I'm thinking, for example, of, of Sir Isaac Newton, the, one of the first uh, recipients of an endowed chair, or perhaps to explore the ideas that shape our cosmos. Stephen Hawking comes to mind in this, uh, in this realm. Clearly, our inaugural Armstrong chair is in good company, no pressure. Uh, support for uh, these chairs really does uh, lead to new discoveries and innovative thinking, especially uh, in the educational opportunities for generation after generation. And you've heard David acknowledge uh, our, our recipients' specific experiences and success here. <clears throat> Yesterday, of course, was commencement. It was 11,700 plus, just not that we were counting. Um, but, you know, to students in the audience and some of our recent graduates, uh, I know that you have the aspiration and determination to really accelerate your own journeys. And uh, there are a number of us who are hoping that, in fact, space is among those destinations for your careers. 
In fact, some of our brightest undergraduate student researchers here in the College of Engineering have recently earned uh, funding from NASA, which challenges schools every, every year around the country to come up with a prototype that they can use in traveling to Mars. The team this year is developing a water delivery system for space-based food production with the goal to grow and sustain plants in microgravity environments. They're mindful that the project has applications closer to home as well, thinking about how similar technologies could help us with food production in some of our food deserts uh, throughout Columbus, Ohio, and, and beyond. Our inaugural chair will, I'm sure, inspire to continue such endeavors. Uh, as provost, I'm deeply grateful for the recognition that these chaired professors confer on our, on our faculty. We can clearly see in this case uh, just how important that is, where we've been able to attract an individual like Dr. John Horak. Now, his is a tall order, the execution of original scientific and engineering research, public policy research in space, student education, and connecting the policy and technical aspects of space flight, three hours a day for sleep. But in doing all of this, he will move Ohio State forward to prominence in the global space flight community. Uh, you've heard a little bit about his background. I can't really uh, speak to some of his titles that you've highlighted, Dave, but uh, just you couldn't ask for a more ideal person in terms of past experiences to be prepared for the work that lies ahead. Uh, immediately prior to joining our university, Dr. Horak served as vice president of Teledyne Brown Engineering Space Systems Group, where he oversaw all government and commercial space programs. During his tenure, he secured two major prime contracts, resi resulting in Teledyne Brown being named uh, NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center's 2015 Large Business Prime Contractor of the Year. You heard that he served an important role as Vice President for Research at the University of Alabama Huntsville, where he also had fiscal oversight for the entire university's uh, research enterprise, including 14 research centers and laboratories. And an, an impressive career at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center uh, preceded that. In addition to his Ohio State appointment, Dr. Horak is senior advisor to the president of the International Astronautical Federation. His expert analysis is sought by aerospace companies and organizations around the world. Dr. Horak, would you please join me here at the podium? It's my pleasure to formally install you as the inaugural Neil A. Armstrong Chair in Aerospace Policy. Please accept this medallion in recognition of this honor. We'll step over here. Where... What a gift. Today's been just nothing but gifts. The gifts of the people that woke up really, really early to make our breakfast and who are staying late. The people who cleaned and prepared the room so we could use it today and switched it out and pushed the dishes away. And I got this gift. And I, I couldn't go on without this. This is a pocket protector uh, that someone gave to me. And so gifts are everywhere. So I, I'll uh, install the pocket protector right next to the Neil Armstrong uh, medallion here. Thank you. Gifts like your presence, the time you've taken today to honor Neil Armstrong, your participation in the celebration. Thank you. It's an honor to be here to celebrate with you Ohio's history and to add momentum to Ohio's future in space exploration as the Neil Armstrong Chair in Aerospace Policy. I'm especially grateful to the Armstrong family, to Mark and Rick, to June, to Carol, to Huntington Bank and Mr. Steve Steinauer and his leadership team, to Dean Williams, to Dean Brown, Provost McFerrin, and to the entire Ohio State community for this incredible opportunity. I'm humbled by your investments in this endeavor, which will certainly be, as Provost McFerrin said, an enriching journey. Journeys are long, 
They are unpredictable trips into uncertainty. Oftentimes they start from a very extraordinary, no, ordinary place, like Albert Einstein sitting on a train, looking at the clock as he recedes away, riding backwards and wondering. Or, you know, this time of year everyone gets excited. There's a spring training baseball field somewhere in Florida or in Arizona. And often these journeys produce results that are more incredible than anyone could imagine. In Einstein's case, general relativity, and in baseball's case, even the Cubs finally won a World Series. So John Glenn's journey to space, Neil Armstrong's journey to the moon, and our journeys are, are similar. We work hard and we struggle, and we move forward with hope uh, despite uncertainty and adversity, and as a result, we grow. We transform ourselves and the world often for the better, and often in very indescribable ways. I hope you've been able to see that play out today in our discussions. The origins of space exploration include the Nazis' construction and use of the V-2 missile in war, an intense competition between the United States and the Soviet Union in the Cold War. And today, space exploration profoundly impacts the quality of life of every human being on Earth. Space has gone from being an immensely competitive national activity of singular accomplishments to being a collaborative international enterprise essential to nearly every facet of our daily lives. In the early days, we watched men from two countries launch to orbit or the moon. And by now, we've watched dozens of flights with hundreds of men and women from 37 different countries go to orbit. Communication blackouts were significant obstacles in early spaceflight missions. And today, we have instant, full-time, worldwide collaboration with, for anyone with a smartphone. We've visited space, with spacecraft to every planet in the solar system, whether you count Pluto or not. And we've discovered thousands of more planets around distant stars. Several human machines and a recording of Chuck Berry have actually left our solar system. We've launched massive telescopes into space. They've revealed to us the origins and destiny of the universe. Americans have lived on the International Space Station nonstop for 15 years. We watch geysers erupt on Enceladus, a moon of Saturn. We watch volcanoes erupt on Io, a moon of Jupiter. We drive vehicles on Mars. We dream of exploring the ocean of Europa, another moon of Jupiter, which we know has more water than the entire Earth. On, on, on Earth, people used to get lost. School friends used to move away and be lost to time. And now, thanks to spaceflight, communication, and navigation satellites have made it possible to never be lost and never be alone again. Millions once gathered in person to watch a rocket launch, camping out for days in the hot Florida sun, and now millions watch the rocket land on the internet and in high definition. And Ohio's past contributions to this journey of space exploration are obvious. And if my wife didn't tell me I always had to empty my pockets before I gave a speech, I could take an Ohio quarter out of my pocket. You remember the state quarters? My kids collected them. Now, only the most important things human beings do go on your money. And the back of our Ohio state quarter, which you probably remember, it's our Ohio snapshot among the 50 separate pictures which document the contributions from each state to the growth of the United States. There are two things on the back. The first airplane, built by two Ohio brothers and an Ohio astronaut, our Apollo astronaut, Neil Armstrong. He was born here, he lived here, he taught here, he retired here. Neil Armstrong and John Glenn continue to inspire Ohio, the state which has produced more men and women to become NASA astronauts than any other. Ohio, a state that is home to critical NASA and US Air Force space facilities and activities. Ohio, the world's 26th largest economy. Ohio, the number one supplier to Airbus and Boeing. Ohio, where aviation and aerospace are a source of high paying and hard to export jobs for over 40,000 people. Ohio, where aerospace and aviation generate over $7.6 billion of economic activity each year. So what goes on the back of the Ohio quarter the next time? And that is up to us. It'll be determined by the people in this room and by the people with whom we choose to work. We will be propelled by Huntington Bank's investment in the Neil Armstrong Chair at Ohio State. And this generous investment in our community will be our rocket fuel. And not surprisingly, it's made by bankers 
who know exactly the kind of rewards great investments can bring. Now our journey, like any journey, is not without uncertainty. There's been ongoing malaise and questions in the United States around space exploration. The shuttle has retired. We currently can't launch our own astronauts. The next great space telescope is behind schedule and very expensive. And what's next? Moon, Mars, Mars, Moon, asteroid, nothing. What about the budget? These are troubling questions. Nevertheless, and I think Al Warden said this, the US and the rest of the world are going to continue to build and benefit from space exploration. Human spaceflight, planetary exploration, science, Earth remote sensing, these non-military peaceful activities, I believe, are going to be more globally cooperative than nationally competitive, and they will rarely be the result of any nation going it alone. In my view, maximum long-term success for the citizens of the United States and of all countries will require the United States to, ply, to supply significant leadership around four main themes. First, the United States government must continue federal investment to grow a vibrant commercial space market. Healthy commercial markets and vibrant innovation are preconditions for the United States and the world's long-term security and sustainability. I mean, imagine walking through North Market here in Columbus. It is, it's thematically integrated, it's vibrant, it has a wide variety of products and services that are available for purchase by anyone, not just the mayor or the city council or Senator Portman, anyone can go in there. And the space market itself is also something that needs to be vibrant and varied. Should include cargo launch to space, cargo resupply, human launch, knowledge generated about the Earth from space observations. And these products must be available to and widely desired by customers who are not just the United States government. Second, we can't achieve all of our objectives through the private sector, nor can we achieve all private sector objectives using the federal government. Public and private sectors have appropriate and distinct roles. And if you think about the federal interstate highway system, what commercial company could, can you contrive that could meet the broad range of objectives fulfilled by that infrastructure, ranging from how you got here today to how your goods get to the grocery store and how we move people and things that are critical to our security. Therefore, we must also continue the US government's infrastructure focus by using today's International Space Station, finishing and flying and using tomorrow's Space Launch System and Orion capsule. Third, I believe the United States should declare and pursue the moon as the next waypoint in our extension of human presence into the solar system as we grow our economic sphere of activity and learning deeper into space. This is not to say we don't go to Mars. But the moon is an essential proving and staging ground for further exploration to test our engineering limits and our biological limits. Just like when you get your driver's license, uh, you don't start out by taking the family car across the country on your very first trip. Building lunar infrastructure is an essential next step. It's feasible within timescales associated with federal budgets and election cycles, and it's also where the rest of the world would like to go, but themselves cannot lead. We have ready-made collaborators, and the United States can profit as an anchor tenant of a global moon village that allows us to share and advocate our values, to build our economy, to push our engineering limits, and to project our strength without having to fire a single shot. Fourth, the United States should deeply engage in civil space collaboration with the world's emerging or fragile economies. Most people in the world, and in fact most of the economic growth to be seen in the future, and probably most of our significant challenges and opportunities will come from these emerging and developing countries. Mutual self-interest, engagement, and collaboration in space serves as a major bulwark to fortify strong relationships on the ground. And this is as important economically as it is to our national security. Now, when I was 10 years old, at the height of the Cold War, the United States linked an Apollo spacecraft in orbit to the Soviet Union's Soyuz. Two Cold Warrior crews docked together in space, collaborating and living as one. Five men who spent most of their careers preparing to kill each other. Why? The bold leadership of the United States, this act helped pave the way for an end to the Cold War and for building the collaboration we enjoy today with the Russians on the space station. Russia is currently the only way we can send our astronauts to space. 
and Russian engines form the base of the Atlas V rocket, which launches our most important national security payloads. Obviously, our relationship with Russia is very complex. But disrupting collaboration in spaceflight as a result of political differences on Earth remains off the table. In my view, nowhere in the modern landscape is there a more important place to build these positive bulwarks and goodwill than with China. And while insisting on complete transparency and not checking our values at the door, I believe the United States must initiate significant civil spaceflight collaboration with China. We must work together with the Chinese across a wide range of opportunity to solve orbital debris or space junk challenges in orbit, to improve our collective ability to see the Earth from space, to address worldwide pollution, natural resource, disaster management, water quality, and agriculture issues, to assure all parties of satisfying their legitimate national security needs, and to move beyond human exploration in low Earth orbit to cislunar space, to Mars, and beyond. As with Russia and the Soviet Union, building productive Sino-American relationships will greatly improve U.S.-China relationships on Earth for the long term. So with these four themes, with time and hard work, I actually think we have justifiable optimism about the future of US and worldwide space exploration. And so to put a slight twist on what Walt Cunningham said today, I don't know that we've necessarily gathered today to celebrate a past golden age of space exploration. In fact, in many ways, I think we can think about the golden age of space exploration beginning the very minute you walk out that door. The time is now. And so as the first holder of the Neil Armstrong chair, my primary role, at least metaphorically, is quite simple. The Armstrong chair, in concert with the Battelle Center, the Ohio State University, we're the first stage of a booster rocket. Like the mighty Saturn V rocket, which propelled three people, a small lander and a small spacecraft to the moon, the booster rockets don't make the whole journey into space. We're big, we're powerful, we are a coordinated precision machine. And yes, we need a lot of fuel. But together, we provide the initial guidance and momentum essential for a journey of exploration that will primarily be undertaken by students and young professionals. If you're a student or young professional, please stand up. I want to speak to you directly. All right. I want you to picture yourself. I want you to picture yourself as a commander of your own space mission. You've trained really, really hard. You've been poked and prodded more than you can stand or more than you care to remember. And you have crashed the simulator many times. And now you're sitting on the top of this massively fueled rocket that's hissing and spitting and groaning and ice maybe gathering all around it and you're going up the elevator about to start your initial stage of your journey of exploration. You're probably nervous. You're probably a little cramped, and hopefully you're excited. You get in there, you look through the flight deck window, you see the moon, and you give Neil Armstrong a wink. Because through this installation of the Armstrong chair, we are formally igniting the first stage of your booster rocket, propelling you from this launch pad called the Ohio State University onward for your journey into the cosmos. All systems are go. Explore far and wide. With disciplina in civitatem, that's our motto, knowledge for citizenship. And as John Glenn and Neil Armstrong have gone before you, go with dignity. Go with a sense of wonder. Honor their examples of service, accomplishment, and modesty. And arrive at all of your destinations as Neil Armstrong himself arrived at the Sea of Tranquility on July 20th, 1969, in peace for all mankind. To close, I am deeply thankful to all of you here today, especially the young professionals, to my family. Mom, thank you for coming and thank you for everything you and Dad have done for us. To my children, John and Claire and Jacob, I thank you for being the greatest part of our lives and for the kind people you have become. And Elizabeth, my wife and my companion and my best friend, thanks to you most of all. 
I, in my career, I used to be the payload. I used to be at the top of the rocket exploring as a scientist, an engineer, an executive, and an entrepreneur. I crashed the simulator a bunch of times. I crashed some flight hardware. I've been propelled and guided by many, many others. Jerry Fishman, my first mentor at NASA, who's here with me today. Michael Griffin, Johann Dietrich Werner, and now David Williams, Trevor Brown, Vishnu Subramaniam. Today, I'm just really humbled to continue that journey by formally becoming a part of the first stage of a massive booster rocket to help you on your journey. And for this, I owe all of you a great deal. I look forward to fulfilling your trust and your confidence, and validating your decision, and bestowing upon me the honor of serving as the first Neil Armstrong Chair in Aerospace Policy at The Ohio State University. Thank you. So well spoken, John. Thank you so much. We're profoundly proud and grateful to have you here in this role. One last thing. We have a tradition here. It's called Carmen, Ohio. So if you all would stand again and join collectively in the singing of Carmen, Ohio. I think Trevor is going to lead us in that, if I'm not, not mistaken. Uh, before you uh, retreat to the bar, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, call our warden. Please come. To... Thank you very much. Okay. And Steve Lee, have a, a small gift for our new endowed shareholder. Thank you very much, Steve. We've, we've snuck up on John with this one. Um, Al and I were talking earlier on about Pete Conrad, and it reminded me of something, that you should never make a bet in the space industry, right? That's right. I think he'd said, uh, wooey, that was... But I lied. You lied? I lied, yeah. <laughs> don't know what it was he but said. But I do that uh, a lot. Yeah, that's okay. Something about that might have been a small step for Neil, well, but it was a big one for me. Well, <laughs> well there we have it's it. your show. Well, we... Um, in that spirit, you should never make a bet in the space industry. I made a bet with John a while back when we were waiting for the chair announcement. Mm -hmm. And I bet him that if he got it, I would buy him his favorite 12-string guitar. No, I didn't do that because someone else had bought it. Well, I, did, I didn't do it, John. It's, not, it's, not, it's not, not my fault. So this unstoppable rocket man's been helping me today, amongst the other Paul astronauts and organizers. Um, as you know, we've been working in Guatemala. We got Jim Taylor to take a special gift off the production line, and I'm just going to give it to you. It's got to go back to Jim Taylor to sort out, but this it's is our gift. It's got to get finished, for, right? Everything's got to get finished. It up. Okay. Give me two seconds, and Where, I'll hand it to you. Where is it? There you go. There you go, Al. Hand it over there. There you go, John. With our best wishes. It's signed by a whole bunch of guys. Hope you enjoy it. I hope I don't drop but, it. But I, but I think you probably ought to get it finished. 
I've heard him play. I don't think we should get it finished. There you go. Thanks for that. Yeah. Thanks, man. That's really cool. Good luck, John. Thank <laughs> you.